Hello everybody and welcome to the webinar. My name is Christopher Bosen. I'm a communications project manager at the Improvement Service. I'm here to support my colleague, colleague <laughs> Anna McCulloch, who is the national coordinator for the Local Child Poverty Action Reports project that is hosted here at the Improvement Service. We have a several speakers here today, but I'm going to hand over to Hannah in a moment so she can introduce everybody. Um, if you have any questions for the presenters today, please feel free to use the chat question function in your panel on the right hand side, and I will then pass them on to our speakers after the presentations in a Q&A session. If you have any technical problems, you can also ask the questions about it there, and I'll see if I can help you from here. Um, the session is being recorded, um, so it will be shared late, at a later date on the KHOP group, I believe, for the yeah. Local Child Action Poverty Reports project. Exactly. Um, and Hannah will also send out a link to it to all delegates. Well, without further ado, Hannah. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Um, as Chris said, my name is Hannah McCulloch and I'm the National Coordinator for Local Child Poverty Action Reports. So thank you, everybody, for, for tuning in today and especially to those who've taken the time to present. Um, and I'll be coming back to introduce all of them very shortly. Before I do that, I just want to do a quick introduction to the session. So today's webinar is focused on the Scottish Welfare Fund, and we're going to be considering it to some extent, at least from the perspective and through the prism of, of child poverty. Um, and the sort of the background to that is that, as most of you will be aware, local authorities and health boards have a duty to report annually now on, on what they're doing to tackle child poverty in Scotland. And part a lot of my role is facilitating that reporting and considering how we can best share good practice around tackling child poverty. Now, of course, the Scottish Welfare Fund is only a tiny part of that story. It's not going to single-handedly alleviate child poverty, but I think it still has an important role to play. It's a safety net that can help protect families from, from destitution. It's a point of contact with households that are suffering uh, the ill effects of poverty. And it's also an opportunity to provide support and direct families towards more sustainable sources of income. So I think it's, it's worthwhile having this discussion. Um, and I think it's also worth noting just before we get started that in the run up to today's webinar, it's been brought to my attention repeatedly that the Scottish Welfare Fund is being delivered in an increasingly difficult context. There's increasing demand in many areas and extremely limited resources. And a lot of local authorities feel there's very little room for manoeuvre in relation to the Scottish Welfare Fund. So while I and all the speakers appreciate that, I think I'm really keen that it doesn't prevent us from discussing what works in relation to the Scottish Welfare Fund and what would be needed to make that happen across the country. And I hope today will be an opportunity for open and frank, uh, maybe not too frank, <laughs> discussions about that. So with all those caveats out of the way, um, I'll just run through who our speakers are today. Um, with me here in Livingston, I've got uh, David Hilber from Child Poverty Action Group and the Menu for Change project. Uh, David and his colleagues have been doing a bit of research looking at examples of good practice in the administration of the Scottish Welfare Fund. After David, we have Amanda Gallagher and Stephen Devine from North Lanarkshire Council, and they'll be telling us about the referral, their uh, refer referral gateway. And finally, we have Latif McLean from Glasgow City Council, and he'll be telling us about uh, Glasgow's analysis of Scottish Welfare Fund applications and also their co-location of advisors within the Scottish Welfare Fund. Mm -hmm. Finally, um, Angela Lindsay, who's the policy manager for the Scottish Welfare Fund at the Scottish Government, was keen to be involved today, but unfortunately was unable to. But she's committed that she'll, she'll watch the webinar and, and awaits comments and questions with interest. OK, so with all that out of the way, um, I'll pass over to David Hilbert from the Menu for Change project. Thank you very much, Hannah, uh, and, and thank you for uh, inviting me here today. Um, so as Hannah was mentioning, uh, I work for the Menu for Change project. Um, it is a, a partnership project that's delivered by Oxfam, uh, funded by the Community Fund. Nourish Scotland is a project partner. I work for the Child Poverty Action Group in Scotland, and the Poverty Alliance is involved as well. And our project is focusing on food insecurity and uh, uh, trying to reduce the need for emergency food aid um, by ensuring that everyone gets the cash entitlements uh, that they're entitled to. Uh, and, and need to rely less on, on accessing uh, emergency food aid. Now, of course, the Scottish Welfare Fund um, is a, a huge um, a resource for people who have run out of money for food. And what we wanted to do um, was identify best practice of uh, 
how the fund is run uh, because it is run very differently uh, from local authority to local authority um, and help ensure that the Scottish Welfare Fund remains uh, an effective response uh, to income crisis. Um, so what we did was we looked at a lot of Scottish government data that's publicly available um, and we uh, attempted to identify indicators of good practice so that we could uh, identify different local authorities um, that seem to be doing something really well. And uh, then we interviewed several of those local authorities and uh, took the findings we got from those interviews to some focus groups that uh, included Scottish Welfare Fund staff, um, welfare rights advisors and support providers, and uh, people with lived experience of applying to the fund uh, to see what their, their opinions on, on our findings were. Um, so the first thing we did was we looked at several different indicators to identify uh, local authorities that we wanted to speak to. So what we were looking to find was what indicates a fast, um, high quality decision on an application that was really easy to make. That's what we thought, um, you know, a good administration uh, should look like. So we looked at decision making times. Uh, we looked at award amounts. Um, we looked at repeat applications. Uh, we looked at successful appeals. So that is appeals that were um, had gone to the, the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman uh, and were overturned uh, in, in favor of, of the claimant. Uh, we looked at onward referrals. Um, so when someone goes to the Scottish Welfare Fund and asks for a crisis grant, if they were referred on to uh, you know, more uh, advice and support services, we, we looked at that. And then we also looked at accessibility. So how many ways can someone apply to the fund? Um, and then what we did was we, uh, we tried to get a good mix of councils. Obviously, um, councils, you know, a Shetland council is going to have a different set of circumstances than Glasgow. Um, so we grouped the number um, by number of applications. So less than 500, between 500 and 10,000, and then those with more than 10,000. And we selected 11, so two from group one, uh, the smallest ones, six from group two, the mid-sized ones, and three from group three. And of those 11 we selected and uh, asked for interview, uh, nine of them got back to us and we're happy to take part. Um, and so who were we interviewing? We, we asked to speak with senior managers, team leaders, and frontline decision makers. And we got a bit of mix from everybody depending on availability and the way that it was set up. Um, and what we were trying to do uh, with the interviews was to better understand how it was administered in that area. So for example, what department it sat within, uh, how staff were trained, um, and how claimants were, were notified of their decision on their application. Um, and what we did when we talked with all of these different local authorities is we looked for trends. So of these nine that we spoke to, what were most of them doing that seemed like it was, a, it was good practice? Um, so the first one that we came uh, across was that when taking a phone application for a crisis grant, uh, most of the local authorities we spoke to had one person taking the application and then making a decision on that application. Um, and the reason they did this was because um, it allows for uh, the decision maker to ask for more information while they're taking the application. Um, it makes things quicker and it also means there's less people for the applicant to speak to. Um, when we brought that to uh, the focus group of people who'd applied to the fund, they said that was really important to them, that they didn't have to continue to retell their story to different people. Um, Local authorities who do this suggested it allows for requesting further evidence by a deadline. So if you know we want the crisis grant application to be decided today, then it's great if you can get uh, all the evidence you need by the end of that day and not have to go back to the applicant uh, and, and ask for more information if a different person took the application uh, and then just passed it to a decision maker that needed to get back in touch with them again. Um, and uh, in terms of quickness, it can sometimes allow for uh, a decision to be made right then and there when the applicant was on the phone, um, which uh, when you're in crisis and you've run out of money, uh, is, is extremely important that you get it as quickly as possible. So, that was our, so that's our first recommendation to all local authorities is that they consider um, having the same person take the application uh, on the phone and make a decision on that application. Uh, our second recommendation is not to use an eligibility checker for online applications. Um, so several local authorities have, if you want to make an online application on their website, a set of kind of pre-application questions that you have to answer. Uh, they vary in how they work, but several of them won't, won't let you continue to the application process uh, if you answer questions in a certain way. 
Um, now, this was uh, something that we found could be, it definitely deters potentially successful applicants. Uh, for example, one of them says, if you have you had three applications within the last 12 months? And if you click yes, then you automatically can't uh, continue on with your application. Um, now, the guidance says that you should have three, you know, you're allowed three in a 12 month period. And then if you make a further application, it can be awarded in exceptional circumstances. This, app, this eligibility checker doesn't allow for that, so that's that's problematic. Um, it doesn't allow for the flexibility inherent in a discretionary sc scheme like the Scottish Welfare Fund, um, and it assumes applicants understand certain terminologies. So, for example, uh, one of the one of the eligibility checkers we saw said, "Have you had a relevant change of circumstances within the last 28 days of your last application?" Um, now, that might make sense to you and me uh, and people who are working quite closely with the Scottish Welfare Fund, but for um, many claimants, that's uh, not going to be incredibly helpful. Uh, and so they might say, you know, no, um, when actually they have and, and miss out on an application because of that. Our third uh, recommendation is to reevaluate what evidence from applicants is deemed to be essential and reduce this where appropriate. Um, so this was especially uh, you know, this came out when people were talking about things like needing to provide rent receipts or bank statements. Um, and people were saying that, you know, we uh, are able to deliver things much more quickly because we're asking for less evidence. Um, and several local authorities we spoke to said, you know, it hasn't changed the, the number of awards that we've been giving out in any real way to be kind of less stringent on what, uh, what um, evidence that we're requiring. Um, and, you know, it's also good for administration on the local authorities part because it reduces burdens on decision makers uh, to find that further information. Um, but it does require m more trust from the decision makers. Um, and, and that's something that uh, everyone accepted. Recommendation four is to make active referrals to advice and support services rather than simply signposting. So instead of just telling someone there's a Citizens Advice Bureau down the road, you can go there actually calling the advice service and making uh, you know, an appointment for the person. Um, all the local authorities that engaged with this uh, said that applicants were much more likely to engage. They had a much uh, higher rate of engagement with advice services um, when an appointment was actually arranged. Um, feedback was, was identified as being extremely important in these circumstances um, because uh, you can't know if it's working or not unless you're getting feedback. But for example, one local authority um, said that they sent all sanctioned applicant, every applicant to the crisis, um, to the Scottish Welfare Fund who had, had been sanctioned, uh, was given a referral to the local welfare rights service and they had an 80% rejection um, or an 80% rate of success at appeal um, on sanctions. So over 80% of the sanctions were overturned. So that's that shows how important uh, this kind of active referring can be. Um, and the local authority said that it's really important that advice services that are being actively referred to give feedback because that allows them to do an assessment of its, its efficacy. Uh, our fifth recommendation was to pay all applicants in cash as opposed to vouchers. So uh, all of the local authorities that we spoke to, the nine we spoke to, all paid out in cash. Uh, and the reasons they did this was because it gives maximum options to applicants. Um, it doesn't restrict them to only go, going to the places that, for example, vouchers are given to. Um, it removes stigma and prejudice. Uh, you know, when you're going to the grocery store and you have to pay with uh, a voucher or something like that, uh, it, it makes it much less, uh, you know, it's more difficult to, to differentiate people um, going with crisis grant awards. Um, and then po pay point was found to be really, really important. Um, because uh, especially in more uh, urban areas, it means that people can go uh, to nearby shops and don't have to travel all the way to, to council buildings, um, which may be far away and may be expensive to get to. Uh, our final recommendation is to give all applicants their decision over the phone initially followed by a written decision. Uh, this makes it, it's the fastest way to get in touch with people and let people know and make sure that they know. Um, and also it allows the decision maker to explain in detail the reasons for the decision and answer any questions from the applicant. Um, and it allows the decision maker to offer further advice or make referrals, uh, active referrals when appropriate. So those are our big six recommendations to local authorities. Um, now, as Hannah had mentioned, 
when we brought this back to the local authorities, they said, um, you know, these, these seem good. Um, there wasn't universal, but there was uh, definitely a majority agreement with all of the recommendations. But one thing that was very clear was that local authorities felt we don't have necess the, the funds and the resources we need to do all of these things. Um, we're doing the best we can right now. And many local authorities are having to take money from their own general funds to supplement um, you know, what they're doing with the Scottish Welfare Fund. So we also have recommendations for the Scottish government um, to consult with local authorities to determine how much money they need to deliver this to a really high standard, uh, including implementing our, our recommendations. So that includes both the administrative budget, which is how much local authorities get to administer the fund, and the program budget to meet, um, which is how much they have to actually pay out to claimants. Um, because we feel that if, if the Scottish Welfare Fund is made more accessible, um, more people will be going to it and uh, can get more awards. Um, we asked the Scottish government to provide more opportunities for sharing best practice between frontline staff um, uh, to review and revise statu statutory guidance that's used to make Scottish Welfare Fund decisions to recommend um, to implement these recommendations, um, which have already been done uh, in some instances. So the the guidance now suggests uh, encourages active referring over over signposting. So we're really happy to see that. Um, and then uh, to review the existing monitoring and evaluation to make sure that uh, best practice is being is being done by local authorities, uh, and you know gives a, a chance to see where additional support might be required. So you can read our whole uh, report on our website here. There's a link there that you can click on. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, I think we're having a Q and A session after the next presentations. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to hand over to Amanda and Stephen, I believe, in North Lanarkshire. Can you hear us? Yes, we can. Yeah, we can. It's Stephen Devane just doing it for, doing the first part of it, though. OK, so you should have a pop-up yeah. now on your screen, and you just click that, and you can make the presentation from there. By the way, a, a question that comes in often, will you share the slides at the end? Yes, absolutely. Yes, we can email out the link um, and it'll also be on the, the Knowledge Hub for Local Child Poverty Action Reports. Okay. Stephen, we can see your screen now, but you need to bring up the presentation. Uh, sorry. We're having a technical problem, but we'll get there. <laughs> That's okay. Just... We didn't have much time to, to go over the... Yep. Can you see it now? We can see it now, so we're just seeing you click through. So that's great. Just bring it well, up. Well, um, it's probably best to, to refresh ourselves about what the Scottish Welfare Fund is. I think an awful lot of people um, have confused the Scottish Welfare Fund um, over the last six years. Uh, with the former DWP service, with its a new council service, with a whole load of other things. And that was partly, I think, to do with the initial uh, marketing of, of the Scottish Welfare Fund. But it's clear to see that we're, the fund is there to provide support for those in crisis. Um, and the topic of today's discussion, uh, specifically in relation to our, our model in North Lanarkshire, is about our food referral gateway. Um, Scottish Welfare Fund in North Lanarkshire forms the, 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 the central hub um, of all referrals um, for people in crisis. And food poverty generates what we all know to be food crisis now and then. Being in food poverty is something which people tend to exist with over a longer term. Um, it can be for a very short spell, but the moments where crisis arise, food crisis is one of the most high priority items or, or high priority uh, areas if you like uh, of concern for customers um, and that's shown across uh, Scotland in terms of how many people request assistance with food. Um, so in North Lanarkshire our model is fairly straightforward. We take the view that you should always contact Scottish Welfare Fund before contacting a food bank and all of our uh, customers are referred through that central hub is to ensure that Scottish Welfare Fund get the opportunity to provide 
uh, financial support to those in crisis, whether it's food crisis or another crisis. But for those in food crisis, we divert them to our gateway. Um, customers do have access to the, the, the out of hours service through, through social work. That's always existed. Um, but at all other times, um, the support would be out with the SWF. Uh, th this slide just shows a model of how we work, as Stephen said, we put the Scottish Well Food Fund at the heart of the hub, uh, so it shouldn't have mattered. What we wanted to do was take an advisor approach to tackling food poverty, that when people uh, presented in food poverty, we were looking at the reasons as to why, and not just referring them on to a food bank. I think the phrase we used was the food bank was like a stick and plaster and a gaping wound. It, it was a short term fix to a longer term problem. So we recognise that not all advisors could carry out a benefit check or liaise on behalf of people. So that was why the Scottish Welfare Fund is at the heart of what we do. And one of the recommendations that was there was making sure that agencies referred in and that the Scottish Welfare Fund referred out to the appropriate agency. And that's what happens here. So if a crisis grant can be awarded, that's fine. If it can, or if there is other issues around about people's benefits or debt, Scottish Welfare Fund will refer on to us and the financial inclusion team. So that's that safety net. Is if it doesn't matter where the person presents, they're getting asked the right questions within the Scottish Welfare Fund and getting referred to the right agency. Stephen said food crisis is a, a major issue. Food uh, poverty is a major issue for us. And using the lens of child poverty, as Hannah was uh, talking about earlier on, we use one of the examples from the food bank. Uh, a, a woman had presented and it was through education that the woman was referred to the food bank. But when at the food bank we were doing a kind of a project to see just exactly why people were presenting at food banks and, and we got this woman. The woman had separated from her husband. Uh, there was a major issue with her benefits and her children's benefits, but we kind of focused on helping her with the benefit side of things. But then we got speaking to her daughter and basically the food poverty had affected her daughter so much. She'd lost her friends. Uh, she wasn't doing well at school. And when we started to ask her what it was, like she couldn't take part in any activities. She couldn't go up the street at lunchtime with them. She couldn't go to the local bands. And what she said was she'd stopped asking her friends to actually come to the house as well because the food bank tins that she had uh, all had big black marker on them with the sell by date. So she was saying people knew that that food had came from the food bank. So she no longer wanted her friends in the house as well. So when we look at food poverty and food crisis, as advisors, we were very gung-ho about making sure people had their income maximised, the debt advice and everything. But then when we started to speak to the families and see what was really happening, it is that bit about food poverty is impacting on our children in, in lots of different ways. And this wee girl, she was basically isolated from all her friends and everything. That woman in particular, she was short DLA for a child, a housing benefit hadn't been sorted out, uh, she was short premiums of herself, and she actually volunteered to come along and speak at food poverty events that we had because she seen the difference that just getting that help and assistance, if she'd got that away at the start, that it would have made in her family. We've got here just a slide that shows you the impact of what we say when the gateway is applied and when the gateway isn't applied. Uh, you can see here there's a 22% drop in referrals to food banks whenever we applied the actual gateway, whenever we, would, whenever we used the gateway, the referrals dropped to the food banks. <clears throat> and what we did was we did a lot of work in-house uh, and with their external partners because what we were finding whenever we spoke to the food banks, it was actually a, a high number of referrals were coming from social workers and we were saying, well, that's not right because they have the advice and information services uh, on the door. And over a period of time, there was an 87% drop in referrals from social work. Now, recently, uh, we put welfare rights officers back in to the food banks to find out we, we became a universal credit uh, full 
Social Service in April 18, and we wanted to see if this had impacted uh, on the number of referrals that were going in or the reasons why people were going in. And what we found is 81% of the people who were attending the food banks were attending because of universal credit issues, which will be no surprise to advisors uh, about the place. But I think we were a bit, we were slightly shocked it was such a high number. But what we did find is that not all advice agencies were applying the gateway, and we have a bit of work out here to do. Now, we have one major food bank uh, that covers four or five of our local towns. And we compared that to another, uh, a, a large food bank. But what we found in the large food bank, which was in one town, it was 56% of their referrals were from an advice agency. And only 6% were from the Scottish welfare fund to with those advice agencies because again the welfare rights officer was picking up these cases and finding out that they really shouldn't have been at the food bank that we could have got them scottish welfare funds there was issues with their benefits we were liaising on behalf of them uh, there's a number of examples where we got people crisis grants so it's that bit about we have the gateway it work, we know it works well because the evidence that we have shows the drop in referrals but what we know that we need to do is a lot more work uh, with the, some of our advice agencies to get them on board and using this properly. Okay, well, I'll just come in then, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, good morning. Uh, so, my name's Latif McLean, uh, and I'm a financial inclusion lead officer for Glasgow City Council. Uh, so today I'd like to share with you some background into a data-driven exercise that was carried out within the Scottish Welfare Fund team and changes that were made as a result. So a key focus in my current roles is aligned to child poverty and to implement new interventions that will address the scale and the challenge in Glasgow to address high levels of child poverty. Okay, so to begin, uh, my colleague and I, uh, we had meetings with key individuals, uh, such as a private rented sector team uh, and One Parent Family Scotland. And a common key uh, theme uh, from these meetings was around the concern uh, for high percentage of crisis grants uh, that were declined uh, from a Scottish Welfare Fund application. So we shared this feedback uh, in meetings with senior management and the Scottish Welfare Fund as applications were also continuing to increase each year. Uh, the Scottish Welfare Fund team uh, agreed to share data that allowed us to take a more in-depth analysis into the reasons why uh, applications were, were applying. So with that in mind, uh, in thinking about initiatives that will support low-income families, we carried out a review of Scottish Welfare Fund applications, uh, and that was from six key areas of the city, and we looked at the ones at the highest levels of child poverty. We only looked at unsuccessful applications uh, applications with children in the household, and we wanted to cover a period of September to January so we could get a real depth and uh, analysis into that. So, uh, as you can see in the bottom left image, uh, this was a picture really of me and two of my colleagues as we kind of locked ourselves away in a room, scratching our heads as we went through each case line by line. So, this was a real painful exercise, but the intelligence we got from this deep dive analysis was invaluable. Um, so, also, the reason code was free text. So we're able to get the full context um, as to why they were applying. So what we found out, the majority of applications were made from loan parents. The main reason for applying was white goods, furniture and budgeting. A high percentage of applications were also made from the Calton Ward. So the aim of the review was to try and understand the main reasons for applications to Scottish Welfare Fund and consider other options that may be available in terms of welfare rights and money advice. So what we did, um, so we then shared our findings back to the Scottish Welfare Fund team and carried out um, in-depth stakeholder consultation. So that allowed us to try and find alternative supports for families um, and get support from referral partners, so such as One Parent Family Scotland. Um, so they would provide holistic support, including money advice, income maximisation to loan parents, and we also engaged with a Glasgow charity, the Glasgow Care Foundation. So they would take referrals from us and provide white goods and furniture for families. So we secured also funding from our community benefits. 
and we were able to recruit a welfare rights officer. So they would be situated within the team and take internal referrals from the Scottish Welfare Fund team. So the welfare rights officer would accept that internal referral from the Calton Ward, um, from those that have been refused and that have children, and would be able to provide welfare rights, money advice, and make the onward referral and apply for grants on the applicant's behalf. So it wasn't about signposting, this was actually making the referrals uh, for that applicant. So we met with the Scottish Welfare Fund team, um, the members and the welfare rights officer, and we process mapped each step of the current process and kind of looked at what this new process would look like. We then met with the full Scottish Welfare Fund team to raise awareness and initially we were looking to get buy-in uh, to this process. So we developed a short referral form that would be sent to the welfare rights officer from the Scottish Welfare Fund advisor and that would have all the applicants details. We also developed an induction pack for the welfare rights officer on the scope of the project, postcodes uh, and key contacts. So the operational uh, service delivery model. So in practice, uh, if an applicant has been refused a Scottish Welfare Fund application, they have children, they reside in the Calton area and they've agreed for further support, their details are passed in a referral form to the welfare rights officer, again, who's sitting in that team, uh, and they'll take that holistic assessment to support their needs. So the aim of this initiative really is to provide the holistic support to not only deal with the crisis, but potentially prevent further applications to Scottish Welfare Fund. We also want to look to maximise entitlement to other benefits and grants. So it's a little too early to report on outcomes, um, but we have implemented our governance monitoring um, of who we felt and we'll be looking to track out outcomes uh, from these onward referrals. So if this pilot is a success, uh, then there may be potential for this to be an operating model to be wider rolled out across the city. Uh, we have our first gateway review um, later on this week, and this will really be a, an opportunity to revisit the process um, that went live in July. So just to conclude, uh, I'd like to thank you for listening and happy to take questions through the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. Um, so now there's a chance for all our attendees to ask questions of the presenters. Uh, please use the chat or question function on the panel on the right-hand side. So while we're waiting for some of them to come in, do you have any questions, Hannah, for our panelists? Yeah, I mean, I suppose I'm interested. I think all of what has been said is relevant, particularly to, to families with, with children, um, even if that isn't sort of di directly addressed. I think the easier you make the fund to access, the easier you make it for, for those that face the most challenges. Um, so it makes it accessible to, to, to families with children as well. But I do wonder, um, either David, through your research, um, it, w was there consideration of families with children? Do, do we know what proportion of applications are made by families with children? And I would extend that question as well to, to Northland and, and Glasgow about how much do we actually know um, out with doing the deep dive kind of exercise? Are we recording that kind of information on a day-to-day -day basis? That was, that was not something that was the focus uh, of our research project. Um, and having asked local authorities for a breakdown, um, uh, I'm not sure, uh, and I'd ask the other panelists to, to tell me what they found, but I'm not sure how uh, robust the, the data is on the, on the applicants. The, the data on, sorry, Stephen from North Lanarkshire. Um, the data on applicants is pretty all consuming. Um, we have pretty much the, the entire household breakdown. So the problem isn't capturing the data. The problem is turning that data into information. Mm. Um, and it's really a limitation on the, the part of the IT providers um, and part of the Scottish government reporting model uh, that doesn't really allow for the sort of flexible, dynamic questioning of the data that, that outside agencies might like to see. Um, the national statistics are available on the uh, Scottish government website. Um, and the, the only advice that I can give to, to organisations is that if you use the Excel tables um, rather than the PDFs or the Word doc, documents on the Scottish Government website, you can extract the data that you require. It just takes a bit of work. Um, but certainly local authorities are recording fairly detailed data uh, on every aspect of the the, 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 the household. So the, the data's there, it's just whether or not we can turn it into useful information. Yeah, it's Lati from Glasgow. Uh, yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, 
we got access to the data and it did give us this focus was all about the children for us um, and it gave us the details of the household income and composition so it, it, it's a huge exercise and to pitch on to that as well that this really was about us taking, removing ourselves from the business and really looking at this data the reason for applying as well was reason code was free text so it really it, it, that itself is a a huge Sorry, we're having some uh, internet issue right here at our end here. So I will just change. Sorry, can you hear us at the other end? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're. We just had a fallout of our internet here, so we did miss the last part, and I think we're still struggling with getting through. Just a moment. So we should be back on now. Sorry about that. We we lost. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. So what I was saying is that uh, having the 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 data, it was all free text, so it was a huge exercise. But you were getting a full picture as to why they were applying, so it wasn't. Putting down one category, which, which might have been helpful for a data anal analytics to to pull off budgeting, money advice, food, etc. But I was getting the full picture was a real statement as to why they were applying for Scottish Welfare Fund. So that data we were able to turn it into intelligence because we got the full picture, we got the reasons to why they were applying, and people do open up uh, on these questions. It is a, a real labour intense exercise, but for Glasgow, I think personally, I think we found this really valuable and it helped to shape these services because we had real data to use as evidence. Thank you very much. Let, Thanks. Let's see if we have a question coming in for you. Uh, where was the Welfare welfare Rights Officer based in the pilot? Uh, the Welfare Rights Officer is actually within the team. and um, So they are, they are situated, they're situated in the same office. Um, so that there is that building rapport, um, and, and it's not as seen as referring out with the, the department, but they're actually situated uh, in the team, so that they can take these onward referrals and a smooth transition. Okay, we we still have room for more questions, Hannah. Yeah, I mean, I have I have a few. Um, the active referral um, that's been talked about by a few people. Is, is great and, and um, great to see that people are, are accessing the advice and support that they need. Is that onward referral, so it's to income max and welfare rights services, is there scope for that to be onward referral to housing, to employability services, for instance? Is that is that happening in, in North Lanarkshire, say? Yes, it, it, it is happening in North Lanarkshire. Um, our referral process doesn't just include, for example, our financial inclusion team. A uh, referral process can include uh, NHS partners and colleagues, it can in, uh, involve other internal council services or the third sector and there has been invaluable support to, to SWF customers from uh, charitable organisations and third sector organisations and in a way some of the support that is available hasn't really been apparent to council services previously until Scottish Welfare Fund had drawn some of these issues together in one point for someone. They have always existed, but the, obviously the course of questioning uh, a, a customer about their crisis allows us to understand what potential solutions are out there. Um, most, of, as, as Latif has said, most of the, the work involved in trying to create a good referral process for Scottish Welfare Fund is fairly labour intensive, but there is and has been a very positive view from third sector organisations because they see it as getting access to more high quality referrals um, in the sense that the people that are coming to them from Scottish Welfare Fund have already been assessed as having been in crisis and have a, a, a modicum of information about them when the referral takes place. Okay. Um, another question that I have is, um, so in, in, in Glasgow, the sort of analysis of the applications has helped to inform the response to applications, I suppose. I just wonder, Scottish Welfare Fund, both 
the statistics and sort of deep dive more in-depth analysis. I mean, to me, that potentially has the scope to be a really useful insight into how, well, from my perspective, families in particular um, are, are managing and how they're managing to access local services. Um, and so I just wonder really, do you think the Scottish Welfare Fund applications and statistics can be helpful in, for, in informing wider work to tackle child poverty through the local child poverty action reports, for instance, whether that's um, how accessible advice is, how accessible housing services are, that kind of thing. Do you think it could be used more broadly? Yeah, I think, yeah, sorry, Latifa. Yeah, I, I think it is purely, I think the biggest bit we got from that was the reason code, um, where people were telling you the, the full picture and they, they were telling you about access and services. It was giving you a picture about being refused for certain grants before on, um, you get real data from that. It is a real intense exercise, but I do. I think it can be a model that, if this works in this area, then we would be looking to, to widen it out. Uh, and as a mod, an operating model, yeah, I think it could be used for other initiatives for, um, for other work that we're doing in relation to child poverty. That onward referral, making the referral rather than just signposting. I think uh, for some people, the signposting method works, and they're happy to do that. But for others, they do need that more and debt support, um, they're not able to, to access digitally, so they do need you to make that referral. So I think it gives people a bit more option. Uh, and I think as a, a support operating model, I think it works. I think it can be used for other initiatives. Okay, thanks. Actually, we've just had a, a related question. Have there been any problems in providing referral data that includes personal information between organisations? Every, every customer. Every customer who makes an application to North Lanarkshire um, does so uh, on the basis that they've signed a disclaimer. Now, at the, at the outset of Scottish Welfare Fund, we took the opportunity to use the disclaimer um, about accurate information, anti-fraud, and, and we tackled a whole load of issues in the disclaimer. But one of the things that the Scottish Government had built in uh, to the original guidance uh, for, for councils when they were drawing up their disclaimers uh, before we had a national form was to ask customers to give permission to share their information with only those organisations within the council or out with the council who we would deem would uh, assist them with their um, their case and that we wouldn't share information for the purposes of debt collection or any other aspect. Um, it was to give customers the confidence to sign the disclaimer on the form that they were making an application that we weren't going to go and uh, tell, for example, the council tax section that they had council tax debt and that they'd contacted us. Because the immediacy of the crisis um, could only be exacerbated by someone having to deal with further complicated issues. Um, but the, the data sharing has been fairly seamless. It's been quite straightforward. We've had a comment as well here that I would agree that signposting doesn't work with people whose lives are already chaotic. The direct referral process is much more effective in getting engagement. Is that your experience as well? Um, I mean, yes. The, the, the I was just sorry. Gonna... The referral process. Go the ahead. referral process. We don't see as a referral process. We see it as a handover. And David? Yeah, um, I just wanted to say that when, when we were doing our research and our interviews, it was really, really clear that um, the local authorities that we spoke to felt that referring meant uh, they got a much better result. They had fewer people coming back for repeat applications. Um, but one thing that they wanted to highlight for any advice providers who, who might be out there listening is that it's really important that the local authority gets data back on how those referrals went. Um, because it's no small task to make active referrals as opposed to signposting. It does take resources to do so. Um, so it's really, really important that we're able to share information as much as possible um, to make sure that local authorities understand that it's definitely worth their while uh, and um, you know, so that they can uh, know about how, how the, the applicants are, are getting on as well. Okay. The... I think one of the things in terms of the referral as well is the referral comes to the financial inclusion team and it's dealt with probably within like a, a, a day turnaround because it's our triage team that deal with it and it's a call out as opposed to wait 
and then somebody making an appointment or anything like that. So we deal with it all in a call out system. We try and contact them three times. If we can't contact them within the three times, we'll send them a text. So it's that bit that we're contacting the individual as opposed to waiting, like a sign posting on somebody making an appointment somewhere. Within Glasgow as well, that's one of the, the ways that we can show that this model works is, is the feedback back from the partners. And that is forming part of our gateway reviews to look at the referrals that were made, what was the outcomes for that, because I think that is, is about demonstrating that this model works and what the benefits are for uh, the applicant. Great, thank you very much. Um, we have one more question coming in here now. This is the time if you have any questions for our presenters because we're coming up on the hour very soon. So if you have any questions, now is the time to type them in. Uh, but there's one coming through here, and again, I'm not sure who it's for. In terms of active referral, is this always by telephone, or has anyone had success with email referral or info transfer using content management systems? Any, David? <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, some of the we we spoke to Fife, for example. They have the Fort system, um, and they spoke very highly of that system in terms of getting uh, making it easy to make referrals and get some information back. Um, I think it depends on on the system being used, uh, and it needs to be used. I know of some other local authorities that have tried um, kind of these ready-made referral uh, systems, and because partner agencies weren't using them, they were still relying on. Uh, you know, uh, personal relationships that the organizations have with each other. Um, it, it wasn't useful. So, I mean, I think that there's definite benefit in them, um, but it, it is dependent on how well they're used, how easy they are to access. Um, so it's not, it's not a simple quick fix, but it's definitely something that deserves uh, consideration. Stephen, did you want to? Yeah, um, in North Lanarkshire, we have brought all of our advice agencies um, who work in the, the area of anti-poverty work or child poverty or food poverty into a, an umbrella group called North Lanarkshire Advice Network. It allows us to communicate, not just using Scottish Welfare Fund to communicate, but our financial inclusion team who are, are probably most closely involved in the design of that uh, inland network, um, allows us to have feedback and allows us to update uh, external organisations. We've found incredible success with just using our email mailboxes. We've set up specific mailboxes for North Lanarkshire uh, Advice Network and all of the referrals that come from uh, Scottish Welfare Fund to Amanda's service um, or out to wider organisations can go through this NLAN uh, umbrella group if you like and it means that we don't have to ask the third sector to always update referral forms or to change data, we can make sure that we give them the same information that we would give to any of the, the larger organisations. It means that small community food banks that, that have been set up in the back of a church, for example, can immediately join our food referral gateway without having to have administrators and people to make systems. It means that we can still contact even the smallest providers um, and it's quite a flexible and, and dynamic and mobile system in that way because people can get their, their emails on the go on their, their tablets or their phones. So it's been very successful using email without putting pressure on the third sector. Latif is um, within Glasgow. Yeah. Yeah, just within Glasgow, um, would be, predominantly it would be through the kind of mailbox referral form that we designed together. However, the, the welfare rights officers building rapport and getting that into personal uh, approach across the partner. So it is about picking up the phone as well and going over it rather than just two way communication just by, by email. There is more uh, a holistic support where they, they'll, they'll phone and they'll, they'll speak to each other and try and build relations and get a better picture for the, from the referral as well. Okay, I don't have any more questions here, Hannah. Um, unless you have any, it's time to round up. Um, yeah, I mean, I might. Uh, very briefly, I suppose, um, it sounds like both Glasgow and, and North Lan have taken really interesting and quite innovative approaches. I'd be interested to hear from both of you, what are the sort of obstacles you've faced with those approaches that, that other areas might want to be aware of if they were if they were looking to take a similar approach, whether that's being very resource intensive or requiring data sharing agreements or 
you know, what are the the practical nitty gritty things that have been difficult for you, and how did you how did you overcome them if you if you have? So to uh, North London. For ourselves, I think for ourselves, it's certainly been getting. It, it's whenever we were talking to advice agencies about it, they would say, "Oh, people don't want to use the gateway," making it out as though it was something, you know, like it's this big gate. Way and that's a barrier in itself. But it's what we try to get across is it's just an advisor's approach. If somebody came in and asked for home care, you would carry out an assessment, you would ask what their needs are, you would ask what the reasons are. If they come in and ask for a change in tenancy, you would ask the reasons and the need. So what we're saying that coming in and presenting in food poverty and food crisis is no different. You ask the reasons why and you look to see what you can do to help. But I think I, I don't know why there's that barrier there. I, I don't know if giving it a name or something itself was a barrier in ju instead of just this as an approach. But you, you've seen from that refet the, the slides when it's working and when it's not. 56% of referrals, it's like over 2,000, 2,500 referrals to one food bank in one area from one agency. That's not right. That That's a barrier in itself. So we know we've got a lot of work to do there. And I understand advice agencies can have problems because it's volunteers that are at the front line and different staff and things like that, and then getting that across. And I, I think as well, it sounds a bit daft, but people just want to help. They want, like if you're a health visitor, you want to know when you leave there's food in the cupboard. So it's that bit about people really just wanting to, to say I've done something. Whereas what we want to do is say, well, let, let's look at the, the bigger picture. Let's look long term because you might get a food parcel for three days, but that person's going to be in the same situation in day four. So I think that's probably been a bit. I don't think there's not been a barrier been a, between ourselves and Scottish Welfare Fund. We've been really lucky in North Lanarkshire that we've had Stephen and his team on board with it. Uh, but I think it probably could be a barrier. Uh, getting people to spend the cash, really. One, one, of the, one of the biggest barriers for Scottish Welfare Fund, um, outside the education element, if you like, of going round your third sector organisations to let them know, first of all, not just that the Scottish Welfare Fund is available in their local area, but how it's available, how it's run, how, it, how the customer experience will be. One of the biggest barriers is actually internally with the council, um, in terms of having the council itself understand where Scottish Welfare Fund sits in terms of internal supports. Um, and that's been a big challenge as well. So getting housing and social work partners on board quite early on is, is, is key to being able to design flexible approaches to Scottish Welfare Fund. Um, I, I am aware that in some local authorities, perhaps the culture of the division or department that the, the, the welfare fund is in makes it more challenging for that to happen. Um, but I certainly find that the, the approach that certainly ourselves and Glasgow have taken um, by making the Scottish Welfare Fund um, a, 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 as flexible as possible, um, we've allowed for uh, more people to access the service uh, in a way that's more humane. Yeah. Uh, and for, for myself in Glasgow, I would say one of the biggest obstacles would be um, applicants accepting that onward referral, like, taking that they would like to get their details passed on to another uh, agency. I think we're, we're looking at kind of ways of trying to kind of promote that a wee bit further. Um, we are looking at when, when an applicant will phone up, the, the call handle will explain what that actually means, um, and to try and record that way if it's not done. Um, just on, on the email. Um, I suppose the gateway review that we've got scheduled this week is a real opportunity, I think, to really look at it from end to end. And I think that's an opportunity to kind of share any lessons that we get from that. And potentially, if, it, if the model works, start slowing and go to a bigger scale. Um, that, that would say has been the biggest probably obstacle is um, the onboard acceptance to the referral. Thank you. We've we're going to take one very last question because now we're, we're this is for um, we're coming up on the hour. David, this is for you. How has how has Scottish government responded to the recommendations? Yeah, um, well, so the Scottish government, we were working quite closely with them while we were doing the research. And um, uh, as I said, I think when I was doing my presentation, um, one of the especially the referring one that we've been talking about uh, the 
doing active referring instead of signposting. So they have changed the the national uh, statutory guidance to um, suggest that you know referrals are the better way to go. Um, uh, there was uh, you know. It was brought up in first minister's questions about this this report, and uh, the minister responded um, that you know, with all of the the anti poverty work that the the Scottish government is funding, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of mitigation that they're working on uh, as it is. Um, but as far as the other recommendations go, we're still waiting on uh, some feedback. So um, we're we're really keen to continue to work with the Scottish government uh, to make sure that these recommendations are implemented. Uh, and, um, you know, hope we can go from there. Thank you very much. We're not going to take any more questions. I'm going to hand over to Hannah to finish this, I think. Yes, that's fine. I mean, I really just want to say thank you again to everybody who contributed. If you think of any questions for any of the presenters um, after you've had a chance to digest all of this quite complex information, um, then please do let me know. And likewise, I appreciate it was a bit of a standing start today. We didn't go into much detail about what the Scottish Welfare Fund is or any background. Um, we can provide that that information if you're feeling in the dark and you can go back and watch the, the webinar again. But but overall, just thank you. And if anybody has any suggestions for, for future webinars that would be useful, um, then please do let me know. But a link to the, to the, the finished webinar will be sent out to you all um, and it will be available on the Knowledge Hub as well. And if you you if you want to ask any further questions, then the knowledge hub is also a good place, so then other can see the answers that you're getting, or the questions you've asked, or supply, or add their own questions to your questions. So thank you very much, Amanda, Stephen, and Latif. I hope it went well there. Thank you, thank you David, for coming. Thank you, Hannah. And I'm really sorry if you ha if we fell out at at a point we had some internet issues. I hope the last part went better. But thank you all for attending the webinar, and I'm going to end the webinar for all now. So thank you, and have a nice day. Thanks. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you.